So there's a lot of crime going on at the moment, not just on the estate, robberies, uh, there was a stab in last week, um, but in London, in Birmingham, in the UK, you know, I stopped watching the news because because every day there was like some murder that they were reporting on. And I was like, it's just, it's just too much. You might feel a bit overwhelmed about what's been going on. One, one of us was, had a terrible situation last week, and thank God, God brought them through it. But at times like these, I find it really helpful, instead of getting overwhelmed, to look at a song in the Bible called Psalm 7, right? And the first line of it is, deliver me from all who pursue me. And, and, and this whole psalm, I'm hoping, will be really helpful for all of us. I mean, even check it out, right? The, the, the beginning, the intro, and we don't know if these intros to the psalms were originally there. Like, we don't actually know if these intros, by the way, are the inspired word of God. Like, but through tradition, we've kept them. So we don't know for sure about these intros. Different people have different views. But we do know once the song actually starts, that's the word of God when we get to verse one. But this little bit at the beginning, that's why they put it in italics. It says, a shigion of David. So they're saying like a type of song that David wrote, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. Now, we don't know who this bloke Cush was. We know he was a Benjamite from the tribe of Benjamin, but we don't know anything else about him, right? We can only guess. But what we know is that David was so troubled by this bloke that he had to write a song to God about him. Maybe in your life, there is someone like Cush who's been troubling you. It could be a difficult neighbor. It could be someone at the council. It could be someone at work. You know, or it might even be someone else, you know, who's hurt someone else, hurt a friend of yours or something. It's a difficult person. And we all experience this at some point in our life. There's someone who causes us great trouble. And the difficulty is how, how do we respond to that? Especially, you know, when you become a Christian and you're told you've got to turn the other cheek and you're thinking, what, do I just become a doormat now? and let everyone do whatever they want. What do I do when, when bad stuff happens? And so let's jump into the beginning of this psalm. Verse one, it says, Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Now, those of you who got the coloring in things, at this point, you can be coloring in the letters, yeah? Because I haven't got any pictures coming up for you just yet. So just color in the letters of, of the psalm until we get to the pictures, right? So it says, I take refuge in you. So David, he's been troubled by this bloke and he's like, I'm going to get refuge from God. In other words, I'm going to go to a safe place. Yeah, like a lot of people these times are trying to find a safe space where no one's going to give them trouble. And it's hard to find. And David knows that he gets that safe space from God. So he goes to God singing crying out his heart to God. And he's saying, God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me. So right there at the beginning, he's like, Lord, will you save me from everyone who's pursuing me? Will you save me, God? So that's our first response, right? When we get in trouble by people is to say, God, will you save me? And then he says, verse two, or they will tear me apart like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. So David's saying, God, if you don't save me, I'm in big trouble. Notice he's praying this before the big trouble actually kicks off. This is actually a prayer you can pray every day before you go down the street. You know, I remember when the, the crime in Roehampton had reached a big high like years ago, years ago. Right. Um, it's not like that now, but it was really high crime. And I would often pray this verse one and two before I went out on the street, you know, just praying, God, will you save me from anyone who will come after me? I had two guys once who were actually after they were looking for me to stab me. And I was like, every time I walked out on the street, I'm thinking, are they going to catch up with me now? And I would just pray, Lord God, I take refuge in you, save and deliver me from all who pursue me, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Pursue is when someone's chasing after you. So someone's trying to find you to get you and you can pray to God, God, will you save me? 
And then he says this, so check this out. He says, Lord my God, if I've done this, if there's guilt on my hands, so he's saying, if I'm guilty, if I'm the one at wrong here, if I've repaid my ally with evil, in other words, if there's a friend of mine that I treated badly or without cause have robbed my foe, so there he's saying, if my enemy, I've actually robbed them, if I've ripped them off, when I was selling something to them or something, cheated them out of something. If that's the case, God, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. So see what David's saying here. First, he's like, God, protect me from my enemies. And then he's like, whoa, wait a minute, God. Actually, if I'm in the wrong, let my enemies catch up with me. Okay, so what, what that means is that if you're in the wrong... Don't be taking verses out of context and being like, my God will protect me, smite all my enemies. If you're in the wrong, repent. Go to God and say, I'm sorry, God, I'm wrong. And go to the person you got beef with and say, I'm sorry, I'm at fault. I'm really sorry about this. I think that's really important because I see people all the time, right, with memes of Bible verses on social media putting all these verses out about how God's going to deal with their enemies. And when you know more of the story, sometimes you're like, hang on a minute. You did that to that person, and now you're trying to quote Bible verses on them? Like, you, you're in the wrong. And some of the beef we get in with people is because we're in the wrong. So we've got to be careful with these Psalms that we're not being self-righteous when we're actually in the wrong. And then he says, arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree what? Justice. So he's saying, God, will you please decree justice? Now notice, David's not trying to take justice into his own hands. He's looking to God and he's saying, God, will you decree justice? And I think that is so important. That, that is so important. Um, I was reading something the other day by someone who was saying that in England, they were saying, The working class in England have just felt for so many years that they haven't been listened to by the government for so many years. And a lot of people have a sense of, there's been injustice, when are we going to get justice? People write to their MPs, they don't get justice. Sometimes people contact the police and don't get justice. And what we find out is that it really messes up people's mental health when there's been an injustice and they're wanting justice and no one will listen to them and they can't get justice. And what the Bible shows us is that we can go to God and we can actually pray, Lord, decree justice. Lord God, will you make the justice happen? And the reason why we can do that is because he's the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords, right? He's seated on his throne. He's higher than the British government. He's higher than United Nations. Yeah, he's higher than Wandsworth Council, blatantly. And so it's like whatever injustice there is, he's the one who can take care of it. And he can just be like, boom, today's the day you get justice. I saw something the other day where there was, there was a mother who'd had her son killed and it took a while for the trial and everything. And finally the killers got convicted and, and she was like, I've got, I've got justice now. And it took a long time for her, but finally she got she got justice. Well, for us, we never know how long we're going to have to wait to see justice, but we can be confident that because God is a just judge, that is already written down in his book, as it were, that there is going to be justice on the matter that you faced injustice on. We just don't know the day we're going to get it yet. We're definitely going to get it on the day Jesus returns, but you might get it sooner. And so we can say to God, God, will you bring the justice? I can't make the justice happen myself. Will you do it? And then he says in verse 7, Let the assembled peoples gather around you while you sit enthroned over them on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my what? My righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. So here... He's praying to God. He's saying, will you vindicate me? So obviously, Cush, the Benjamite, has been saying some things, spreading some rumors or something, making David to be out in a bad light. And David's saying, God, will you vindicate me? Will you show everyone that I'm in the right on this one? 
Okay, so now this is important again, right? This is a situation where the psalmist, David, the singer, is in the right. And so it's, again, just a reminder to us, we need to consider, are we in the right or are we in the wrong? Because sometimes we might cry out about an injustice when we're in the wrong. And we want to be able to say to God, will you vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness? I'm in the right in this situation. Will you vindicate me? Uh, I've had integrity. I've been honest about the situation. Will you help me? And then verse 9, he says, Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure, you the righteous God who probes minds and hearts. And I love this because we got a prayer here, bring an end to the violence of the wicked. Listen, in the 90s, right, when I used to listen to a lot of hip hop, I've still got one of my old tapes where I was listening to it a while back. I found it like stuck under the TV or something, you know. And I started listening to it and then there was this one tune that came on called Stop the Violence. Right, and then, and then there was this bit where the rappers just kept repeating, stop the violence, stop the violence. And it just makes me think of how for years there have been people in the community saying, stop the violence. We, we, gotta, we gotta stop knife crime. We gotta stop gun crime. We gotta stop domestic violence. And, and they keep being pushes for this. And sadly, the violence carries on. It keeps carrying on. But the Bible encourages us to keep on actually asking God to stop the violence. We can still say it in a community, stop the violence. It's good to have projects to stop the violence, definitely, and to fight for that. But as well as telling people in the community to stop the violence, we need to actually say to God, God, will you stop the violence? You know, if there's like people around Roehampton right now looking for certain people to get revenge on them, I can't talk them out of that. You know, when someone close to you has been hurt, it's very hard to persuade someone to not do something about that. Ultimately, the person who can stop it is God, right? So we want to keep on, for people who live in London, we want to keep crying out to God, saying, God, will you stop the violence? There's too many young people in London dying in the last few years, praying to God, will he stop the violence and make the righteous secure? Will he keep his people safe? Because what happens over time is you see Christians say, oh, I don't want to live in London. I want to move to a safer suburb, you know? And instead of that, we want to say, Lord, will you make us secure here so we can be salt and light in London? All right, then verse 10. Finally, I've got a picture for you to color in. I'm sorry that it was such a long wait for that. So he then says, my what? My shield is God, most high, who saves the upright in heart. So David here is recognizing that the thing that will defend him is God. Now, David would have had a shield. He was a warrior king. He would have had all kinds of weapons. But instead of trusting in his own strength, he's like, God will be my shield in this. And we can take that same mentality in London. God will be our shield, whether it's COVID-19, violence or anything. We can pray, God, you're my shield. Help me to trust that you are my shield. Help me hold this shield of faith. And then he says, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. If he does not relent, now check it out here. It sounds like it's saying if God does not relent, but if you look at other translations, you'll see them translate it as if the, if the wicked person doesn't relent, which is what I think makes more sense. It's saying here, if the wicked person doing violence doesn't stop their violence, God will sharpen his sword. God will bend and string his bow He has prepared his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. So this is one of the reasons why we don't ever need to get revenge on people, right? Even though sometimes we feel we want revenge on people, we don't because actually what God's word says is if that wicked person doesn't change, God's going to deal with them with his flaming arrows. Now, obviously, these are not literal arrows with fire that suddenly 
man's walking down the road and suddenly an arrow goes in. This is like poetic language, right? And this is saying that God is going to deal with them somehow. God is not happy about the way they're living their life. Leave it up to God. You don't have to get vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. So we, we leave it up to him. He will take care of anyone who's ever robbed you or harmed you or anything like that if that person doesn't stop and turn to God. Now, if the person does stop and turn to God, then you've gained a brother or sister in Christ. <laughs> and even though right now you might not feel like you want them as a brother or sister in Christ, over time, when, when you're in heaven, you will, because you'll have a totally renewed mind, they'll have a totally renewed mind, and you'll be like, oh, my best friend, you know. So it will work out all good. Then he says, whoever is pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. So this is like, if you're you're pregnant with a boy, you give birth to a boy, okay? If you're pregnant with evil, it's not meaning like an evil person, but just like if you have evil inside of you, you would give birth to evil. And what he's saying here is that people who think about evil a lot they end up giving birth to, here it's translated as disillusionment. Me, I find it more helpful to think about the Hebrew word behind it in this verse as delusions or delusions of grandeur. You know, there's, there's times where I've been chatting to teenagers and, I, and I've asked them, like, what, what do you want to do when, when you're older? And Eva premiership footballer, right, or, you know, like mega famous musician, yeah, yeah, or seriously, drug dealer, okay, and, and the thing is, there are, there, there's, there's two boys that used to come to this church back in the day that are now in the premiership, so, so it can happen, it, it can happen, right, but when teenagers start talking about wanting to become a drug dealer, I'm like, that is delusions. It's, it's, it's a delusion. It's a dream that you're going to be something that you think is amazing, and it isn't amazing, because more times it ends up with years in prison. It can end up with you losing your life. It can end up with your family members hurt and even killed. And the amount of money you make by the end of it, you would have been better off working at Asda for 40 years. Seriously, like, and then buy a, buy a property and get equity on that property, you'll be so much richer, okay? But it's delusions. The devil sells people a lie saying, look, do this and you'll be really successful. And God says, no, that, that just gives birth to delusions. It doesn't work out the way the wicked person thinks it will. So check it out. I love this verse. It shows God's got a sense of humor, isn't it? Verse 15, whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. So what this is, right? This is someone who's like, oi, I'm going to dig a hole. And the next person who falls, who walks past, they're going to fall down that hole and I'll get him. Right? So they dig this big hole and they're like, they're like, yeah. And then, whoa! And suddenly they have fallen in the hole themselves. Tell me, tell me about Pokemon later. So... So this is what happens in real life. People plot schemes and it actually hurts them. Okay, so so then there's another one. Verse 16, the trouble they cause recoils on them. That means like it comes back to them. Their violence comes down on their own heads. So here you see, you got a picture of Garfield, right? And Garfield's got a boomerang and Garfield's thinking, (laughs) ha. I'll get this dog. I'm going to throw the boomerang. He'll run after it. But he, he is not going to land. He's not going to be able to get it. It's just going to come straight back. Whoa! And then it would hit him in the face, right? So Garfield is trying to do a thing to this dog. I've forgotten the dog's name. But Dodie, yeah, something like that. But instead, obviously, the boomerang's going to come back and hit Garfield even whilst he's got this smug look on his face. And that's what happens when people try and do bad things to you. The Bible says it will come back on them. You reap what what you sow, which is another reason why we can relax a bit. We could be like, Lord, that person has really wronged me, but I know it will 
come, come back on them. Lord, will you bring justice? Pray that way instead of being all angry and holding on to anger. And I tell you what, over time, you will actually find that that prayer will grow. And over time, you will start praying for the salvation for that person. You start praying that God would keep them from the plans of the enemy. That, and you start praying blessings for them. Okay, But it's sometimes hard to get to that stage unless you can first acknowledge this stage. Now, I've seen some people that want to deny this stage, and they're just like, no, 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 no. No, I will, I will love my enemy and pray for blessings on them. And I, I can see it in their face, and I'm like, you're still really angry at them. Just, just pray this bit now for now. Like, don't lie to God. <laughs> God knows who's saying, Lord, bless them. Like, God knows that you don't really mean that. So pray this. Let God's Spirit work on your heart as you pray for them. The more you pray for people, the more you get love for them, right? So you pray for your enemies, and over time you find you love your enemies more, more and more. I've got an enemy right now on the estate, right? I pray for her quite a lot, do you know? And uh, I wish she knew that. I wish she knew that, but she won't even talk to me, you know? And, uh, but I just keep praying for her. I just keep, it's pretty, pretty much every day I'm praying for her. You know, I'm praying that God would bless her and help her and that he would save her and everything. But I couldn't pray that much for her a few years ago. It's taken, it's taken time to, to get there. Okay, then verse 17. This is how it ends. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his what? Righteousness. Righteousness. I will sing the praises in the name of the Lord Most High. So here, earlier, he was talking about whose righteousness? His own. Yeah, he was saying, I'm righteous in this situation. I've had integrity in this situation. I haven't done something wrong. And at the end, he's, he's focusing on God's righteousness. He's saying, I'm going to praise God because of his righteousness. He's going to start singing to God because he knows God will always do right. And because God's righteous, he will never let a wrong be ignored or overlooked. It will always get dealt with. Either it's going to de get dealt with on the day of judgment, or it's going to get dealt with some kind of punishment in this life, or it got dealt with at the cross. And either way, God's righteous. It gets dealt with. Now, what I also find comforting about this is that, you know, earlier I was saying, you've got to make sure you're not the one in the wrong. Well, when someone's wronged you, let's face it, it's very hard to be 100% in the right. Yeah, <laughs> like, like we could maybe be 90% in the right, but I'm sure we've all had those experiences where someone's wronged us and there's, there's ways we haven't responded the right way. So when we come to a psalm like this, we might be like, I can't say, oh Lord, look at my righteousness, <laughs> look at my integrity, because we're like, yeah, but there was that one time I shouted at them. Yeah. What's wonderful to know is that because of Jesus' righteousness, because of Jesus' righteousness, we can actually go before God knowing that we look righteous in his sight. Because it's like we are clothed in Jesus' robe of righteousness. So all the ways that we've responded badly to being wronged, that just gets washed clean, like a, a dirty robe being washed in the washing machine, and we're given a clean robe to wear, which then means we can have the honesty to say, God, I haven't been totally righteous about this. Please forgive me. Thank you for your robe of righteousness. And then you don't have to feel any, any, guilt, any guilt about that. If, if you've wronged a person, say sorry to them, obviously. Make it right where you can. You know, if you stole someone's packed lunch, you don't just say, I'm sorry, I stole your packed lunch. You bring them a packed lunch. You say, I'm sorry I stole your packed lunch. Here's a packed lunch for you. You know, you, you pay them back. You do restitution. But then we don't have to feel guilt before God. We know that because of what Jesus did at the cross, that we've got his righteousness. And so then we can sing praises to him for that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for your righteousness. And we know you are a holy God. We come before you admitting that we have often 
responded badly when we've been wronged. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord God. Thank you that you wash us clean because of your blood shed at the cross. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to pray when we're wronged, that you would help us to pray about the violence that's going on in London and in, in England at the moment. We pray to you, God, will you stop the violence? And we thank you, God, for the comfort we find in this psalm. And will you help us to live this out? In Jesus' name, amen.